we need to break down what you're talking about, but whatever you want to call it, edema, swelling, how long it takes to subside after the last training session. But I think the question is legit. I'm working on that. I could use them. But I, again, it's challenging because... Welcome to the N1 Experience. Brought to you by N1 Education, the leader in fitness education. All right. Welcome back, everybody. My partner in crime today is going to be Dr. D'Souza. Did I say that correctly? Yeah, that's, that's quite very good. Really quick, why don't you just give a quick little background about yourself, Doc, and actually what has made you such a relevant person to lead into this topic today? <laughs> I don't know if I'm such a relevant person, but yeah, thanks for having me, Kaz. It's a pleasure to be here and, and have this conversation. Really excited about the, the topics and, and the things you're going to be talking about it. I'm originally from Brazil, so I finished my PhD in 2014. So then I was invited to come to University of Tampa. It wasn't my first time at UT. First time I came to UT was 2013 to standardize ultrasound measurements. So that was the reason I came to the lab. My first time in US was 2010 at American College Sports Medicine meeting. So then I was doing my PhD with Eric Donny Acid, was the partnership with Mike Roberts from Auburn. So it was kind of a translational study combined animal and human trials. It was pretty cool. Then they needed someone to teach a grad course about measurements. It was, I, I forgot the name of the course, but it was exercise nutrition size techniques, measurement techniques. And they needed someone I taught and they liked it. Here I am 10 years later as an associate professor at University of Tampa. So I have been studying pretty much everything related to how resistance training impacts body composition, performance, and ultimately muscle growth. We have been published about volume and the last, the infamous 52 weekly sets paper, right? I think a lot of people talking about it, but I had another paper published about this topic two years ago. And we have four papers in the pipeline at this point with a training volume. So I think some of the critics I understand, but it try to advance, I'm trying to advance the field with proposing RCTs that help us understand better. There's so much to understand when it comes to volume. I, if I'm somehow relevant, I think because I've been publishing a lot of papers in this topic regarding to resistance training, high, low training, exercise variation, cell auto-regulating exercise uh, selection as well, repetition speed, and, and probably the last five, seven years, we might be one of the labs that had been published most papers in trained people. Again, that's my background. <laughs> so I think it's also really important reiterating that you also have done work in what some of the methodology is in terms of how we're measuring this stuff in terms of ultrasound. And I think that is important context with some of the yeah. topics that we're going to talk about today. And then I'm actually just going to lead right into that. And because I think it's kind of, we're in this interesting space in terms of the discussions around science where there's one perspective of, are we sitting here and talking about all these studies with the possibility that these results don't mean anything? And there's some people that have that perspective. And I kind of sit in the camp of, I don't really know that I think we're in a, an absence of evidence on a lot of these questions. And so I'm curious what your take is there and how much. So in terms of the ecological, or I'm sorry, the, in terms of the methodology, in terms of hypertrophy measurement, how confident are you in the way that we're currently measuring hypertrophy? Mm -hmm. That's, that's an excellent question, Cass. I, I'm going to start from the basics. When to have a conversation, whether a device is capable of measuring something, we always need to talk about validity in, in the simple way. Validity is the degree in which a device measures what it intends to measure. The very simple way, right? So, and there are multiple steps for validation procedure. I published one, I had the two or three papers about validation. One paper was comparing ultrasound with MRI. And 
throughout the, the validation procedure, there'll be a moment that the both devices gonna measure the same thing, the VL cross-sectional area, the quadriceps cross-sectional area, and when we compare those measurements, they must agree with certain extent. So again, everything I think was Brigato, the, the Vami paper with a 32, 24, and 16 sets. They used the A mode ultrasound. It's a little harder, but I, I think they still were able to measure. It, it, again, if you look at their absolute chains, were the smallest when you compare the papers. But again, the A mode is, is a little more tricky. But we are confident. But it's not because something's valid. If it's not done right, so then you can't measure properly. I think that's something really, really important. So again, the gold, the gold standard is MRI, and I was fortunate to, I had a four papers with MRI at this point. One kind of, it, it became quite famous paper from 2014 when we varied exercises. We had one group only doing squat and other groups varying exercises. So we used MRI. Just sharing something behind the curtain cast, that's pretty, when we submitted the paper, you see like a, a science is, again, you're not perfect, but we, we strive to do better always. When we submitted the paper, uh, we submitted with the whole quads cross-sectional cross -sectional area. And we didn't find any significant differences between the different interventions. We had a varying exercise, varying intensity, and the combination of a varying bowl for just one. So we're four groups, 70 something people, 12 weeks of training was a lot of work. When we submitted, uh, the reviewer uh, got back like, come on guys, you are using the gold standard. You can easily identify individual heads of the quads. Then we were like, a moment, it's a lot of work, really? So 72 paper times 72 people times two, and you need to outline each individual head. So we did it. And because we did it, we found that the groups that varied exercise were the only groups that significantly increased all the individual heads. So that when we submitted, the, the outcome would be no difference. But because we had a gold standard, can I share, let, let me show you something real quick. Can I share the screen? That's how your quads looks like. Can you see, uh, I'm being very professor now, right? Mm -hmm. So again, that's a CT image, but we can calculate, volume is a 3G structure, right? You can do, you can do such a thing like this. You have a, you see like a multiple cross sections. That's how your quads, your type looks like. So, and then you're going to add individual cross sections and cross sectional areas. Then you talk about, that's a content constant one over three, because you're talking about a three dimensional structure. That would be how every time you see a study reporting as centimeter that's supposed to be a M cubic because that accounts for the three dimensions, right? The, the width, the height, and the length of the muscle. So MRI is the gold standard because in that paper, you see if you get your rectus femoris right here, I can easily outline, you never seen that, right? So, so you never had a guess to doing such a weird stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so that we, the, the view at the, the, the rectus femoris, then I can come over here, outline the whole VL. But again, cross-sectional area accounts for the two dimension. If you look at here, we have a, you can see the two centimeters squared because in that measurement, we account for height and width. And again, that's why I am a rise gold standard. You can easily outline and see difference between muscle groups, right? It's so easy. Mm -hmm. Then you have a yeah. thickness. And that's from the study we did with uh, intersect stretching was a hot topic a while ago. Now it's volume, I guess. Everything we did with untrained, we found something. And that's a study, the only study for trained people using chest. So here's the pack major. So now it's a unidimension measurement. You see, you have uh, the ribs, the coast of the bones right here. So again, they all are valid. They, they, all those measurements are valid for measuring hypertrophy. You just need to understand that when measuring thickness, you just look at one change of the, the adaptation. You might be, is valid. And again, we do have studies from, I forgot the, the last name is Frenchy. He's from uh, Italy. So he showed, uh, again, we published uh, a validation paper that 
cross-sectional area of VL compared doing through ultrasound is very comparable to uh, MRI. And Franchi also found that there is a high co correlation between thickness because we did a validation for two dimension for cross-sectional area, but they found that thickness is highly correlated with uh, MRI imaging. We, we, we are confident what we are using is able to measure hypertrophy. You just need to keep in mind that yes, muscle thickening is not a crap. Muscle thickening mm -hmm. is a bad assessment, but it only tells one dimension of the story. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So cross-section tells you the, the two and volume and not, not so many studies. And again, very few studies use MRI, but rather than criticizing the method, I, I'm a measurement error freak. All my studies, I spend a lot of time talk about measurement error. We don't, every time you're going to start, I talk about my lab. I know so many other pe people, they do right as well. Every, every study I have with students, we blind the, the assessors. The students who are going to be measuring, they're blinded. They don't know who is going to doing, who is going, who is going to be doing what. And then before the study, we start practicing the measurement. So we get five, six people from the study, and then we start to measure the same things we're going to measure. Then they need to calculate measurement error, CV, typical error. As long as they are below three, two percent, then they are clear to start measurement. They need to convince me, and every time they start doing this. I go down by the lab and like, what do you tell me the numbers? All right. You are, because especially for trained people, those measurements, cross-sectional area, thickness, they don't change more than two digits. You usually talk about five to 7%. So I'm saying that rather than criticizing the method, because everything you are using is valid. Otherwise you'll not be able to publish is pay attention to the measurement error and how the authors are reporting the measurement error in the paper. Then you can figure out if that change is bigger or is smaller than the measurement error, right? So every measurement has error, but it needs to be, we need to control it in the way that allows us to, to, to measure what we intend to measure. Mm -hmm. I hope that clarifies. And I, I was not to be, be so much professor. <laughs> <laughs> no, and I think those visuals are going to be really helpful for anybody that's that's watching the visual here, you know, because I think a lot of people aren't actually, you know, having that visual helps a lot more compared to, say, the description, you know, in one of these papers. And I think also, you know, seeing the process of taking those images from the MRI and how you're able to do that compared to maybe some old, like I know some old papers where they're they're estimating cross-sectional area by taking muscle thickness and then they're using like a tape measure and doing circumference you know of a limb and so i think you know understanding the level of precision that we're getting to allows us to have a little bit more confidence when those differences are small versus with some of those old methods where there's a lot more estimation and a lot more yeah. you know room for error then when the differences aren't small or on the chance that there's differences that are very like they, they don't fit in line with the rest of the research, then it's like, mm, how much of that? So there's a, there's a study on the triceps that's like this that found a huge growth in the triceps, you know, in terms of cross-sectional area, but they'd used one of those circumference measurements with muscle thickness. And I'm like, hmm, how much of it was yeah. partly the fact that that measurement there just leaves, you know, a large room for error. And I think so- the or not so I think journals are not so strict about hey show me because again every time I'm reviewing a paper uh, as a reviewer I was reviewing a systematic a systematic review before I joined uh, this this conversation and for me it's like show me you have a novel question that's worth it to be answered and that I can trust on your methods and I think back then the journals were not so strict about especially applied journals about measurement error. The example you gave me has a systematic error because it assumes that muscle is a perfect uh, circle because it assumes the p-value, the, the pi, the, the Greek pi, the radius number. Again, that's a systematic error, big, big time. And sometimes like a, one paper about lengthening partials, the Goto or Goto, they use trained people and they found 50% increase in the tricep, 50, 5, 0. I never seen such a thing. Is that a systematic error? Because even for the other condition, they, they found like a 25 is too 
big big time change in my opinion. But yeah, you 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 had a you had a good. I agree. Back then, the things were a little different. <laughs> yeah. So I think you know when it comes to ultrasound, the the two biggest critiques that I hear one are the skill of the technician, and you know if you have MRI MRI images tracing that. That's a much lower skill requirement than actually taking the measurement with the ultrasound. And then the other one is the swelling, you know, and the edema type topic. So if you want to just like quickly speak on kind of the challenges, you know, from an ultrasound, from a technician standpoint and where you think we are there, especially in like variants across you know, labs, because some places they have a dedicated technician and sometimes it's just a grad student that's kind of like been 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 trained to it. So if you want to speak on that and then we'll get into the big topic of the, the swelling. Yeah, no. <laughs> All right. So, yes, you are absolutely correct. It is very, it is a skill. And there are so many things that might change the measurement that, again, I know everybody criticize Brad and Brad is like a close friend. We have been publishing together about not being blinded. And because what you said, sometimes like you don't have, I, I, I always was fortunate to have a group of students that share the same passion about lifting and we are always working together. And I always train, I, I'm going to be training those students to do the measurement. But ultrasound, for example, you need to be sure that pre and post testing, you are measuring at the same side. Because it's slight change. Because usually we use the femur reference. It goes 40 or 60. And through palpation, we find the greater trochanter by the hip. We find the lateral condyle by the knee. And then we measure 40, 50% of that distance. So if there is slight change, that changes the, the measurement big, big time. So pro, I have my mouse here, probe two, because think about that. Ultrasound is a device that sounds, it sends out energy, right? In, in, in sound energy, uh, sound waves. So and it's coming from here. If you tilt the probe, that also changes big, big time pressure. So you can't change the measurement in, in such huge way. So frequency, because for example, there is an inverse relationship between frequency and depth. So when the measuring chest, I increasing the frequency big, big time because that increases resolution. But when they want to go deeper, like a pods, for example, not pods, because usually I get anterior ties, so I get rectus femoris on the top and VI below, but I, I need to see deeper. So I need to change the, the frequency it gets a little blurry because how the frequency change the the echo coming back, but the frequency also we need to analyze all those factors. So usually what we do in the lab, I think after doing that for a while, we sometimes we using the best ink tattoo like Rena ink tattoo, but we are in Tampa. People like to go beach, they wash it off and like oh we lost it, but we standardize also that from the top of patella. I know what is the distance for 40%, 60% marker. If someone loses, we, we, we should be able to find it. And we save the picture. So the student technician, right? Let's call this, usually students, graduate students, they, they do that. So when they, at the post-testing, when they pull up the, the, the image, the pre, they can use anatomical landmark. Oh, that fibrous tissue. Oh, we are right in the right spot. So we kind of a double check with, my ultrasound allows me the new one. I bought it like a, two, three years ago. No, not me. The like university bought it. So they were happy with what we were doing. So I can, while I'm doing the measurement, I can pull up the previous measurement and I can like, a, yeah, that really much looks the, the, the right one. And again, we always report to the measurement arrow. So you see so many things can, we not talk about swelling yet, but just for standardization purpose, the people get in the lab, they need to stay laid on the bed for fluid, fluid stabilization for 10 minutes. Then we're going to standardize all the measurements at all, all those parameters I told you. We need to account for them because, again, if you press a little bit, that changes big time. If you tilt, that changes. If, if you're not the right, so many things can mess up the measurement. And that's because 
Every time you're doing that, there's a lot of training before the commencement of study. Just figure out, they know what to do. They know what to look at. I tell them, we work a lot of gel and just drop the probe on the skin. And then once you drop the probe, some labs, they use probe holder. You can kind of fit the probe and just that, that avoid pressure as well. So, and with ultrasound, for example, we are able to measure some muscles are way easier, like a cross-sectional area. I think that rectus femoris and DL, it, we are pretty good at it, like a not big deal, but it's quite hard if ultrasound get out the four muscles of the quads, even for a peak in its standpoint. For a cross-sectional area, VM, VI, VI, pretty, pretty difficult. But with MRI, it's so easy. Like you said, I remember the person getting the, the person gets in the tube. So then we see the femur. We just show the softer cut here. Measure the femur. Give me 20, 50, 75% that distance. Boom, boom. You saw it was way easier. So again, ultrasound, well done. That because I told you. It's not because it's valid. It's always going to give you something that is, is correct or you can trust. As long as it's done right, you can be confident. Yes, that's the outcome. But like I said, there are so many things that can impact and change the measurement. Yeah, I was actually talking privately with Eric Helms on why we don't see the vastus medialis measured. Because when the, the most recent study on training to failure came out, and I was like, well... They, they came up with a essentially a null effect because they used the rectum and the and the yeah. lateralis. And I'm like, well, that's not the whole quad. So it's, if they would have actually summed up all of the quads, I wonder if it would have favored the failure group being that the first exercise works more of the vastus muscles, right? And the second exercise more of the rectus, right? But that, that's a great point, guys. But that does not invalidate the study based on what... No. Look, so I, again, right... Based on what they look at, is what the extrapolations can you make? We can't extrapolate to the whole quads, like you said. That that's the kind of exercise, and, and that's what make me. Oh, it's got darker here. I'll give you a sec. Okay. And that's and that's definitely what made me join social media like a, only four years ago. I think that's the type of exercise we need to do and educate people. Yeah, we people work hard to get those studies done, but we can't generalize the. We just look at the head part of the story, right? Just mm -hmm. two out of four muscles. But uh, again, it's so expensive. MRI is not accessible. We got lucky because we had a physician. We met him and he was very into research with a lip team. And he was the, 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 the coordinator of a medical facility and with MRI. So all my studies for biopsies, MRI, I was training people, Greg Student Life, training, training people throughout the week, muscle biopsies on Saturday, MRI Sunday afternoon because we are, again, that's how we did it. But yeah, it's quite hard to get funding for the studying trained people. I, I always like to share, I was NSA conference three, I, I think it was Orlando and Mike, Mike Orsby from Florida State he was presenting pretty cool data. And so on. yeah, but would it be nice to see that, that kind of a dating trained people and Mike Orsby like, there is no money there. <laughs> And, and again, MRI costs a lot of money, but you can easily, like I showed you, we can easily outline, all, see all the quads, muscles, everything else. But maybe someone millionaire wants to fund us, which we find MRI, we can do it. Yeah. But, you know, some, I think, I think maybe the future is, is actually going to be some of us that have influence starting to crowdfund studies. Cause I think at the university level, there's not, but there's enough self-interested egos in the in the bodybuilding space the people that i th that i think we could do it so i think that's on the horizon and potentially future so yeah let, let, let's push this this this, this thing class I, i'm i'm down big time i like that yeah. <laughs> so i think we've established that you know our current measurements are are valid as long as you know they're they're done properly so the the second part of that question though is is that what are we actually measuring? What 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 is this muscle thickness and what is the muscle volume? Because from a hypertrophy perspective, people like they want to know is this myofibular hypertrophy? Have I added have I actually added the new 
contractile proteins or is it something else? Is it fluid? And I, you know, I think you're a great person to talk to on this topic because you've also worked with with Chris Berka, and you know he's done a, you know, obviously that kind of connects you to the bodybuilding world. And he, you know, they did that look into like the the last week going into a show, showing how much volumization that you can have just with dietary and fluid. You know, so it's okay. We can change intramuscular fat levels very fast. You know, and water and stuff, and then. The critique, I think, that's come kind of more so from, you know, people talking about the research is the swelling or edema and what's going on there. Like, is is there, especially in in the the quote unquote, I hate calling it the fifty two set paper, but everybody knows it by that. But no, that's <laughs> yeah, because because not only was the volume group higher, but the the volume was progressing, so there was a slight novelty being added throughout the protocol. Would that then make it more susceptible to that? And my questions like are like right now is, is how thoroughly have we actually looked at the methodology in terms of determining when is the optimal window to measure the that and what type of standardization do we need? I think most studies try and do some sort of, you know, reporting to control for nutrition, you know, but should we actually be having a nutritional intervention that ensures a sufficient amount of calories for a certain amount of days, like going into the measurement so that one person isn't just a little bit more dehydrated or their muscles are a little bit less full, especially when we're looking at some of these volume studies where it, the, the training is also quite dense and with higher volumes. Like I think one of the responses that we might expect to see would be a lot more stores of glycogen and stuff in response to especially high volume and more we'll say metabolically demanding training because of the density, you know, of the training session. So what are your thoughts on what are we seeing and how confident are you in the methodology in terms of what we're measuring and the time frame and standardization around that? And that's a great question. And you've touched on so many things that I hope I remember to, to touch on all, all those things. Uh, 40 starters, uh, I think, one good thing that the paper did was to raise the question about what are you measuring, right? Uh, are you measuring actual contractile protein accretion or you're measuring swelling? And the question is legit because we don't have a timing course. Surprisingly, we don't have a timing course studies in trained people after the, the last training session and, and to see how long it takes to the edema, whatever. We need to break down what you're talking about, but whatever you want to call it, edema, swelling, how long it takes to subside after the last training session. I, I think the question is legit. I'm working on that. <laughs> Could use them. But I, again, it's challenging because just like we're going to get, I'm going to answer your question, but just like I started the conversation with Christ Christoph Barakat, Spartan in Prime, and the good, good friend of mine, and I had the other professor, Carlos Ugrinovich, is a big, big time researcher. We started the, the conversation like, a, but to do that, think about that. People did not jump in in 26 sets per workout because that was the 50. People did not jump in like this. They slow, slowly progress. I can say slowly because if you do the math, the last four weeks progression was about 10, no, not 10, 13, 14% increase compared to the previous training environment. It's not that much. What scared people was the 52 sets. And again, they they slowly progressed all the way there. So now the question, because the question is like, a, how are you going to quantify this? Because they were training for 12 weeks. So we should have, I, I want to have a group with a 10, like a one condition, like a 10 weekly sets, like 10 sets per workout, because that would be 20 or 11 sets per, or 10, 16 and going all the way to 26, for example. And then we're gonna measure, do the time we measure at rest, they do the workout, the same workout, like a less set to failure, two R in R, and then you're gonna measure immediately after 30 minutes, two hours, 24, 48, 72 hours, and maybe 96. I think that's, that's is a lot of work for a cute study. I'm, I'm actually all on it. I, I, you can, we can talk later if, if because the, and that's what I love about research is the, is that 
design conception, the challenging about thinking. I like to say, I don't know if the analogy you land, but it's like a camping in the cold night with a short blanket. So that's how, what are you going to call it? I know if I'm going, people will understand, but like a design wise, de designing a study is it, kind of a dealing with a short blanket in the cold night when you are camping and you need to figure out what you're going to cover, what you can't. And uh, again, we, we try to answer just to say the question is legit because we don't have a time course in trained people. How long does it take to subside? Ejima, swelling, whatever. Uh, we need that study for sure. So I'm, I'm curious too if there's going to be some individual variants with that and also whether or not the training protocol itself will be an impact because, I mean, I would think that certain, it just seems that certain training protocols tend to have a little bit more, it's an exercise in general, tend to bring a little bit more delayed onset soreness and maybe we're getting into more of the neutrophil and like kind of like that delayed inflammation response versus the acute swelling that we get, you know, from training. And there seems to be variation between both exercise selection and just the overall like protocol, like short rest, long rest, high reps, you know, low reps, et cetera. And then there's, of course, then the individual biology in there. So yeah. I, I see this as being a very difficult question to have a, a hard, finite answer, but it I'm is. very excited to see it actually being looked into. And, and again, that's, that's, that's because I love what I do. I, unfortunately, my job is my, my passion. Like after my, my, my kids and my wife, and she's black belt, if she hear this, I don't know if she's going to watch it. She's going to watch it. But anyway, so I think that, once I started to, to hear the, the critics and I was like, I don't have a study and because exactly what I thought too, right. it's, it's, it's so hard. And now we're trying to put something together. All the things you said, like, for example, when you do measurements in the lab for muscle size and the, another thing, I think you are doing not better, but different and try to add one more piece. Every, every study from my lab, we measured thickness and local fat-free mass accretion through DEXA. So we have a both measurements. They, one can be a proxy of another one. They're not the same because fat-free mass, you are measuring the mass that was changed in the, 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 the whole tie. And then the thickness, you're measuring the muscle size. So, so something, again, and every time we do those measurements, people are fasted for 10 hours. Mm. So to, because what you said is, is absolutely right. Like, uh, 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 Christoph work the case study, they found that people in contest, they like ideally, and that happened, they increase intracellular water. So again, what you said, and, and, and I agree, but it's challenging. We still working what the design is going to look like. It's going to be a weekly subject design. We're going to replicate the, the NS protocol because NS again, Alison is, is, is he became a friend. I was that, like a long story short, that project was his master, man, was only his master. And I was invited to be on his examination board. Then I made those suggestions and his mentor, Tacito, great guy, like, hey, we need to talk. And then we put the design together. So again, we, there are so many unknowns about designing to address that question. But now let's let do. Let's dive into edema and because sometimes I think people can, are quick. Can I stop you one? I, I want to ask yeah. you one thing because it, it's relevant right now and it's just a, a slight deviation to you sent me some unpublished work and it, I thought in one of those that you looked at correlating muscle thickness and lean mass correlation. So can with that, we don't have to get completely into that, but I'm just curious if you can quickly say what are your thoughts on th those results and whether or not you thinking that you have some correlations there between the muscle thickness and the lean mass and whether or not that's at all valuable data in answering this question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's a good question. The, the papers in the review, it was rejected by important journal, well, the most important journal. And, and I was so upset because the comments were easily addressed, but again, the, the editor decided to, to reject. So it's submitted to a different journal now. But like I said, we have been trying to put a more measurements of the muscle mass accrual or muscle size. And that was a, I had those because this, I also work on a big data from kind of a retrospective 
data from all the studies I was involved in. It's a collaboration with uh, Allison. We're putting together so many data, like I think you're about 150 subjects, highly trained. And I had that data from the lab, but it was interesting because what, what, what I sent you was pretty much each dot represents one individual and the size of the dot represents the volume load. And we saw that the volume load, not necessarily the digest of that graph, it shows that there is some agreement and it's good agreement between fat-free mass accretion measured through DEXA and muscle thickness change. But the, not necessarily the people with higher volume load increased more both metrics. I think that's what, so the measurements, they talk to other. And if you remember the way to look at one rep max and strength endurance, no correlation at all. And that was quite surprising. And like, I, it makes sense, but we always assume that, yeah, if you're stronger, you might have a better endurance, but uh, that was the goal for that measurement to show that besides the agreement between fat, local fat-free mass and muscle thickness for the same muscle or same region, not necessarily the people with a higher volume load increased more both metrics. That that was the the goal. But they agree those measurements. I, I like a last time I I I don't know if I talk about the paper, but the last time I checked from data from the lab, the correlation was about 0.68, almost 0.70, which again like a considering the differences between those measurements is it, somehow like a moderate, almost a strong agreement between those measurements. So the last question I have on the fat-free mass is just like, how small of a segment are you using with the DEXA? Like how narrow of a site, like how, because we're comparing the muscle thickness to a very specific site. So how close are you to like just getting a slice that's close to that site? Or is this, or are we kind of looking at a slightly like bigger picture with the fat-free mass on a smaller slice with the or no, no, like sure. a specific point of thickness for, for that study because I have a compound movement so we pretty much we drew a rectangle so that's a cool thing about that not all DEXA devices they do that you need to have a, the tool called ROI region of interest so if I want to draw like a half of your biceps and now tell me if fat free mass accretion here I can do that with my DEXA it's getting older I, I should get a new one next year I guess but what we did was, as we use compound movements, we draw the region of interest. We cut from the pelvis, the IDI crest, all the way down to the condyle. That was the area. So think about that. Coming from IDI crest, and I draw individual rectangle to get each thigh. And the rectangle was from IDI crest all the way down to lateral condyle for one leg. And then we did the other leg. And you added up both. So that was a larger area, right? Considered. It's almost the whole muscle length then. Yeah. And, and yeah. Okay. We kind of used iliac crest because we had like a hip flexion in those movements. For example, when they did a rep tempo study with trained individuals, was a weighting subject design and was a knee extensor exercise. We only used the femur reference, rate to color, lateral condyle. For that study, we used all the way to iliac crest all the way down to individual's knees. Cool. All right. Uh, that, 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 that was it on that. Now we can move on to the swelling topic. Are you going to talk about the edema now? It's important to define what we're talking about here because, like I said, there's different time courses and different sources of fluid accumulation on different regions or whatever. And so, for example, the fluid outside the muscle, that's not going to show up in a muscle thickness measurement the way that we do it now but a cross-sectional area before where maybe they were doing a circumference or whatnot, that would have actually impacted those results. Yeah. But yeah, no, but now I, I need to answer a question because <laughs> so about the edema and so again, the question is legit because everything we said about, we need a time force and why finally, like, I, I think so many people are looking at this question now. I hope we get more data, not just for my lab. I hope I'm able to do something about it. It's challenging, and again, when you accumulate more studies, we can draw a better picture. But something that I, I don't get upset quite often, but I realized that so many people were using the 
Ijima slash Swelly as just criticizing the paper because the findings did not fit their bias. Uh, and now I have a paper with a low volume with a substantial muscle growth. And now we're going to get hit from the other side. <laughs> but anyway, but it's like, I don't like the criticizing per sake of criticizing thing. Because for me, yes, we don't have a data, but what we know already about this topic. So... And you need to break it down. I, I really talk about transitory edema. So we talk about fluid, water, hyperemia, inducing swelling. It's definitely to talk about it. Because if that's what you're talking about it, does it last 72 hours? Probably not, right? Mm -hmm. Not talk about water. You talk about the pump. Training people. And, and again, like uh, I talk about transitory swelling, water, fluid, blood flow. We talk about hyperemia, inducing swelling. Does it last 72 hours? We need to do the backwards exercise. That's one thing if you think about transitory. Or are we talking about inflammation, muscle damage, inducing swelling? What we know already about this topic. So, and here is something we need to talk. I think it's our, our job to, again, the question is legit, but let's look at what we know already. So we know that damage, like if you want to measure damage directly way to measure muscle damage, you need a muscle biopsies. And then you're going to look at the Z line streaming. So the line that separates sarcomeres. So we're going to look at the Z line streaming. That's how we measure damage directly. And then you have a indirect markers of damage. Circumference, inflammation markers, CK, range of motion, and strength. Right, those would be probably the most used. Uh, are you are you familiar with the? I believe it's called shear modulus. I believe is a a new proxy that they're kind of looking at for muscle damage, and that they're kind of correlating with the inflammatory response that's associated with the calcium ions. Yeah, I I heard it. To be honest, I have not read about it yet. Okay, but what we know, and again, what we know is okay. That's Z-line streaming is the kind of direct direct way to assess damage. And then you have the indirect markers. And like I said, uh, inflammatory markers, CK, circumference, range of motion, and strength. Those are the indirect markers. So what we know is that usually when it comes to exercise inducing muscle damage, we talk about the data we have is untrained people doing unaccustomed exercise intervention. And they're not used, they were not used to that intervention. And then they experienced huge damage. So I remember read, reading a paper that the people that was a uh, 120 uh, reps with 120% of eccentric strength. Again, those protocols are brutal. Usually overload is centric because it's centric is what pretty much produces the, the muscle damage and people could barely brush the teeth. The study stated that. So again, we talk about muscle damage, exercise induced damage, swell inflammation, usually overload is centric, hardcore protocols and untrained people doing unaccustomed interventions. What we do know is that we have the repeated bout effect. And as we start a new workout, you get sore. As long as you repeat it, even though if you are applying progress overload, we don't get that sore anymore. So and my, my, why I'm confident that, again, did swelling play a role in your measurement? Maybe a little, but why, what gives me confidence to say, I think primarily we measured muscle mass accretion and muscle size change. Why? Because the best, in, so far, the best indirect marker for muscle damage is, is strength. If you are sore, if you have inflammation, that decreases the neural drive to your muscles. You can't exert force. Muscle damage decreases force production. And what we saw in our participants, so the last two weeks, again, they were slowly progressing. They were doing the same exercise because we had a two weeks. Uh, we have a four weeks acclimatization. We dropped their volume for two weeks. We bumped up the volume all the way to 22 for the other for the other two weeks. 
Then they started the program for 12 more weeks. So you talk about 16 weeks doing the same exact exercises, the same intensity, just applying progress overload. When we did the last change in the load, when we increased the last, when they went from 46 to 52 weekly sets, when we did that, strength did not drop. If you look at the, 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 the volume load progression, I know we're going to talk about that later, but strength did not drop. Their performance did not drop. And was interesting because they were dropping, like the drop, if you compare like a first and last set within exercise, like a first last set for the squat, first last set for leg press, first last set for knee extension. They dropped way more at the beginning of the study compared to the last part. The last part they, they were, and again, I keep telling because I, I keep saying that because I, I keep studying, training people. You, you don't imagine what the, those people are able to, when they, we push them hard, they handle it. And again, I don't think damage plays such a role because for me, the most, the best indirect ma marker we have is the strength. And when we increased the volume for the last two weeks, they did not drop performance and the strength increased at the end of the study. Again, I understand the critics, but also let's look at what we know already and put the things together. Can we do better? Definitely. We definitely need a time course study looking at swelling. And if it shows that, you know what? The protocol you did, the protocol you did had a huge swelling influence. But that's the case. We, we got to do measurement in such a different way now, right? We at least 72, 96 hours. And if it takes too long, are you measuring atrophy, disease? It is tricky. But again, that's what upset me a little bit about the critics about swelling that people are just criticizing without leaning on what we know already, right? Share information like I did. I am 100% confident. That's not how science works. I'm not. But based on what I know, I might be absolutely wrong here, Cass. Fine, that's fine. But based on what we know about transitory swelling or inflammation, muscle damage inducing swelling, and the markers we know and how they perform it during the study it, it is that's my position about swelling. I, I I would like to hear your thoughts. I don't know because people never shared such perspective, right? I I don't know. I want to share two things, and the first is don't take too much offense to I know the I people pointing this stuff out in the field because I think it's it's not like it may come off as a critique of the research. But in reality, what it is, is people unsure whether this is relevant to like they're they're not confident that they can actually take and utilize this in the field. Right. And that is a completely different scenario than understanding the limitations of what it takes to do a study. Like these are two different worlds. And so it's perfectly valid for somebody that's working with people in person to be like, look, for me to do this, I would like a study to show me all of these things. And that's what would make me confident doing this in the real world. That's not a critique of saying, okay, this, the study was done bad. It's just, there's this gap between what we can accomplish research and how well we can say for sure, this is something that I'm going to apply today with my client, because I know that this is going to have that desired effect, right? The second thing, and I'm purposely going to take kind of a more contrarian role than what than than what my actual opinion is, be, just so that I mean, because that's the whole point of this, right? Is to almost give a voice to to the critiques, critiques, but in, in a balanced form. Is if if the differences are so small, then would I? I mean, that's the thing. Well, the differences are small. Therefore, if swelling is just a small thing, could it still be the thing that's introducing that trivial difference? And another potential like argument would be if we are using the proxy of strength, at, at what particular rep range or intensity do we need for that to show up? Because if you train in the real world, you know oh, if you're a little bit sore, but it's not a very heavy weight, it's a little bit lighter rep range, you tend to be able to maintain performance dose, especially if you have a couple RIR to work with. And then soreness can kind of impact the sub subjectivity of your perceived RAR, et cetera. So there's some noise there. So the argument could be, it's like, well, maybe we're not working at high enough intensities 
for that to show up or maybe it's CR. That would be like, I would think it's not a very strong argument, but I could see from the opposing side that that would be an argument. It, 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 I think that's the type of uh, exercise we need more discussing, be open for both sides. I'm always, I, I, l like I said, I'm always open to a different perspective. I think that's what makes us better and try like where Kaz is coming from with, with this and what the part I might be missing and, and how we can approach that in, in the study. So I, again, the... Everything you said is worth questioning. We, because we don't have a data, my, again, it's something that I also keep saying that, and people might not like this, is people training harder in the lab than by themselves. Because, and we all like all different labs, not just my lab. We have a bunch of people who love lifting. We wanna push the field forward. We want to advance the field, the knowledge that we are into very much. We all are experienced lifters. Like Alison is the first author of the paper. He's a, a, a powerlifter coach. And like a, he, he's, a, he's a coach. The, we had the last one, his mentor. His mentor is a very funny guy. Like he's almost 60. And he's, he's a PhD, black belt of jiu-jitsu. And he's still lifting four plates for that. Almost 60. So he's mentor. So again... We are into this, we have the theoretical, the knowledge we study, but we also, we have the practical, the practical side. When you have a training studies in the lab, I go downstairs all the time to see how people are training and come on, that's not who I are. That put a more weight on that, that next set. So we always like, and always I have a Chris Barrick, Josh Bradshaw. I had Alan Murphy, guys who are amazing coaches. Those, those were my students training people in the lab. So I'm um, keep saying that. It's something I need to figure it out. I, I keep saying the lab effect. Maybe what you are looking at study is inflated because people train in the way they don't train by themselves. Because you have a people pushing you every set, every rep. And when you're going to train by yourself, it's, it's not that motivation, not that control. So for me, we, we can talk more about study training people. I think we need a acclimatization phase that people get in the lab. Then they train for five, six weeks the way we train them, like a pushing them hard every set, every rep. Then we start the intervention. Maybe the concerns, I, I like. I, I love your questions, the, the things, the points you made. And we always thinking about those things when it comes to, how are you going to put that in a design? And always dealing with a short blanket between the one side you have the ecological validity, the other one you have internal. Right, mm -hmm. how much control is always dealing for that. But again, my counter argument is what I keep hearing from people in the lab. The last study, the last three study coming from my lab, uh, we have a people squatting twice their body weight uh, for a parallel squat. And what I keep hearing from them, I never train that hard, and they train hard in the lab. They they train usually. And that's something I, 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 I keep wondering. Are we looking at inflated? I'm thinking inflated. That's the actual outcome. But are, are they able to keep that up or the gains? Are they able to keep those gains once they go train by themselves? That's something I really need to answer as well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I know we don't hear people talk about the lab effect. If you ask any lab, like they're going to tell you, yeah, people train really, it's, it's, it's a hardcore intervention. You know, in terms of the relative effort, I can see that as a as a decent question when we're looking at studies where that is the thing that we're testing, like we're training RIR versus training to failure. But for volume, you have the same coaches, you know, or, or the you know, in there working with the participants. As long as you would, the volume effect should still be there, even though we could argue, oh, somebody might think that they didn't train quite hard enough, but still what's actually being compared, that, that that wouldn't matter that much, right? As long as we're still kind of, everything's moving on scale. So if everything was one more rep and reserve than what we, than it was reported, we should still see the effect of the volume, right? It just happened at one more RIR or one less RIR or whatever it may be. So I don't, I don't see that like, oh, it's people aren't training hard. I don't see that as a credible argument 
in looking at studies comparing volume per se, unless you are just trying to figure out like if you're trying to pull a specific number, right? So when it comes to the absolute magnitude of sets that are being pulled from these studies, I'm going to, I'm going to jump ahead, but we can come back. But the ecological valid validity of the actual volume numbers in these studies compared to real world training volume. And I think this is what really kind of throws people off is if you look at these lab protocols, right? And Enos, you guys did, it was at least two minutes rest between sets. And I do have a question on the time. No, that's good. At the least. Time on that's that one. Correct. At the least. Right? <laughs> yep. And it was the Abe, they did two minute rest and three minutes between exercise and the, the Brigadi or whatever. It was like 60. So almost like, I think there's only one study that looked at like 20 plus sets that used at least a three minute rest interval. So all of these program, all of these protocols are likely much more dense than what people would be doing. Like not a lot of trained lifters only are going to take two minutes or 60 seconds between sets of yeah, squats, I especially hard sets of squats. And when we look at the actual, like when we look at research on rest intervals and we compare, all right, resting longer between sets versus shorter and then volume equating the load, it seems like, oh, like volume, as long as we're over a certain intensity level with the loading, getting the volume load is kind of what matters. So the question is, is oh, in this, was 52 sets really the same as 30 sets if I were somebody that was resting a lot longer, right? What is like, what is that scale? And so that is one of my questions. So in the ENA study, and I have two reasons for asking this question. One, just to get an idea of the actual density, but two, because in another discussion around this, somebody estimated the average rest and it was different because when in, in the end it said, I think both the the middle and the high volume group averaged about a hundred minutes per the, for the whole thing, like to, to, to right. complete. Yeah. And so my first question is, does that include, cause they had a warm up period in there and then they had that little bit of hamstring posterior chain work in there. All, I'm, my interpretation was that hundred minutes included everything included. That wasn't just a hundred minutes for the quadriceps. So in that instance, if we're, if I'm estimating the density, it's much, it's still relatively dense, but if you take out the warm up and the hamstring, that it seems like they got a little bit more rest. So I don't know if that's something that you can clarify for me. Yeah. So I, okay. So I'm going to start from the last question. So that a hundred minutes was pretty much the average because again, we have a high, not high, right? You have one day was 10 to 12 reps and the other day was to eight. And they, as you said, they rested at least two minutes. So to be honest, and, and that's like, and as we, as we do, I pretty much out-regulate my rest interval when the few ready to go. I don't keep a look at the stopwatch pretty much. But we are very strict to the two minutes mark. And sometimes like a people in both, in, in all the groups, sometimes man can have a 20 more seconds to go for this one, 30 more. So that was the average. And I don't think we account, I can double check. I'm not positive at this point. I don't think we account the warm up sets. I think that's just for the, the working sets, the main, the main workout. I can, I can double check and then get back to you and you can add a comment here when that goes goes live but what i know for sure two minutes at least and across the three groups we had sometimes man I, I need 20 30 more seconds is that okay and we recorded and that average came from the other groups the 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 not all the groups for the the two higher volume groups and also considering they have a different rep range between those two days, like it was, was, was kind of, that was the average. So there are questions you made, Cass. I, I don't have an answer because, and I agree for you. The question is, and, and I love that. Do you need the same volume when you are training at high intensity? Probably not. Do we need the same volume when you are resting more? Probably not, but we don't have studies there. And, and again, those are the questions. Ideally, right, we should have the same studies with, now think about design-wise, how many more groups, how many more people 
I would love to have uh, the same study with uh, two, three, five minutes in between. Mm -hmm. that, would, that would be great, yeah. right? But I, 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 I can't answer your question. I, I tend to think that you might need more volume when you're training at lower intensities, right? So training, if you're training like low, like a low rep range, like a six to eight, like a close or two failure, do we need the same amount of volume that if you train like a high reps and so many like a short rest interval and high rep range? Probably not. And, but we don't, we don't have a data to ideally, we should look at those studies with two minutes rest interval, three minutes rest and five. Then we start to be able to figure out the, the bigger picture. But again, those questions are legit, but I, 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 I agree to you that compare, partially agree. <laughs> I think, I think people train, I think people who are more concerned because for me, strength is a big component of my workout because I'm going to be turning 48 in August. So keep strength is really, really important. And to be honest, I would meet all criteria for my studies. And I study 20 people. I would squat for 1.5. I would bench for 1.2. I would do all, all, but I can't be in my studies because I'm getting old at this point. But I, I would say that I partially agree with you because I think people who are more concerned about strength they are more concerned about the rest interval a little bit longer. And my impression that usually people more concerned about hypertrophy, they out-regulate more their rest interval. And I don't think they rest way more than two minutes when they are training by themselves. That's my impression. And again, it's not a, it's, it's not a data. It's not, it's my impression. Okay. So, but I agree for you that the workouts we have been utilizing they are way more, they are denser. The, the, the density is way higher compared to workouts for high intensity or depends on someone's goals and, and something like that. And the not important thing about ecological validity, right? The degree in which research, uh, design, findings represent real words, how applicable they are. I, I, I could not agree more with you because who is able to do 52 sets per muscle group per week? Of course, that, that progression, right? If you are able to do that, to do that for a spe speci specialization phase, how many groups can you do that? But that's one shape. And I agree, it's not doable. Even for me, like uh, with uh, two kids and, 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 and like a uh, husband, professor, researcher life, it, it's, it's hard. Like I drop off the kids at school and I have one hour each to, to work out, which is plenty of time to me. And, and, and this is it. I, I agree that aspect of ecological validity is important to, to talk about it. But again, the value of those studies, when we talk about extreme environment, those extreme environment studies is that with our NS, we were not, was not like the, the question behind was, hey, we have the inverted U. And we haven't seen that taking place yet when it comes to performance. And if you're going to do progression, so we did a pilot to figure out what would be the idea of progression, what people would handle. And man, let's try, let's go for 12 weeks and let's progress all the way. If you do every six, six, six sets every other two weeks, that's 52. Again, that would be probably the highest volume, not because you want to do the highest volume study in the literature. We want to, we would like to see, would that produce negative responses, just one person, right? Dropped size and performance, but that was, I think is one side of ecological validity. Yes. Those workouts are way denser compared to what people do in real world. I, I, I take that mm -hmm. I, we need to advance more about the relationship between rest interval and the dose response relationship with volume hypertrophy. Definitely, we, again, we need to, to advance more that as well. But the, the value of those studies is that we, we need to figure out when the, the U makes the turn and performance goes down, hypertrophy goes down. That's why we went all the way to 52. Not to <laughs> make people upset about lack of ecological validity, but to try to answer one more question that was the inverted U. So I don't know if you would have saw this, but like shortly after your that that 
the Ina study like started making its rounds on social media and everybody was getting all upset about the 52 number. I did a series of polls on my Instagram, you no, know, and one was just like, hey, do you think doing 26 sets of quads twice a week is an insane amount of volume? And everybody's like, oh, yes, right? But I kind of tricked people and I f like I fed them with different questions and I asked them, it's like, hey, what do you think about doing two 90 minute workouts for quads a week? And everybody's like, oh yeah, that seems like completely reasonable. Right. Especially in my popular, like the people that follow me are all going to be people that love spending time in the gym. So, and that's why I think the density aspect, I mean, if we have at least one, maybe two studies looking at saying like, if we equalize for volume load, then we can rest more or rest less. And basically we can get an inflated set number for the same volume load by just simply using short rest. And there's tr plenty of training volume, things like the Vince Gironda 8x8 eight eight with 30 seconds. Like it's not, you're doing the equivalent of four hard sets of 15, but you're doing it over eight sets, but it's not the same amount of, of volume load. And so I would love to see a little bit more around that. But instinctively, I kind of lean towards the set number is slightly inflated. And I think that's why it's so hard for people to relate to some of these high numbers because they're looking at training the way they currently do, which might be like, like if I, like me at my stage in my career, if I do a set of squats to a legit two RIR, like I'm taking way more than two minutes, right? Like it, I might be a, a person where it's, if I want to get repeat performance, I'm in this six, seven minute round, right? For a, for a very heavy exercise like that. But I'm somebody that's closer to being able to squat three times my body weight rather than two times my body weight. And I think that there's the scaling thing with strength and muscle mass, et cetera, and whatnot. And so you have some people, if you take somebody from like the high intensity camp, where when they do one set, they do it. And like their goal is to take that one set until their eyeball is like popping out of their head. And then they're in their mind, they're thinking, how could I do that 52 times? And it's like, well, that's not what's going to happen. And some people have been like, oh, it's impossible to do a set to failure and then go again and go to failure two minutes later. And I'm like, no, it's not impossible. Your performance is just going to be gonna drop substantially the less. Yep. And that's kind of the next thing that I wanted to kind of ask you is, I don't know if you have any reference for how much of a performance drop there was over these. I know um, Milo Wolf, Dr. Milo Wolf, I'm sure you're familiar, but he was challenged to replicate this and he did it and by the time he finished the squats he, 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 you're the the i didn't know that that yeah he did it I, I i can send you send you the video if you want to see it but by the time he finished the squats he was using basically half the load for half the reps by the time he finished by the time he got to like to the ninth thing and i think that's another thing that's lost on people's look these are not the sets that you're used to because if you were looking at like you you wouldn't train that way in the gym selectively like you would if you were auto regulating your rest you wouldn't be going so densely that you were literally losing half your weight and half half the reps you you would rest a lot more and therefore you probably wouldn't need to do as much like you wouldn't need as many sets to get the same volume because your performance is dropping off significantly so i just think that there is this perspective of because the actual set number is high in these very dense things the, it, it's lost on what that volume load would look like if we were putting it into what a person's natural training conditions are and how much they're resting, et cetera. Especially you're like, okay, I'm you're using three exercises, but when you like in most applications, if somebody were doing this high volume approach, they would probably, it'd be over four or five or six exercises lots of the time. And it's not that hard to accumulate sets when you start adding in. So if you were doing say three exercises, on Monday and then another three exercises on Thursday and you got six exercises and it's like, well, you're probably not just going to do one or two sets. You're probably at least going to do three or four. And all of a sudden those numbers start to go up. So I just think it's important for people to understand that the absolute number of sets is not likely as high volume as what most people kind of take it away. And one of the things that we do in some of our live events is, is we will actually have people go through different protocols with one limb and another limb and compare their volume load across oh, doing do. a short yeah. or a long rest and stuff like that as a basically as an n of one experiment for themselves 
and I, you know, for me teaching coaches, I want to instill the flexibility that they have because sometimes it, it, you know, in a real world gym setting, you can do things at a fast pace. Sometimes you need to do it at a slow pace. And it, it, most coaches, if they were to train purely on some absolutes in the research, they would not be doing justice to their clients because they would just be too inefficient with their time. Look, in the real world, we can't necessarily do optimal. You, If somebody only has three hours, you have to make that three hours count for as much as possible. And if that means that we have to decrease some ideal things for some efficiency things, that's going to be much more favorable for that client's outcome. So a lot of what we're doing is trying to show the flexibility that people have. Like, yeah, cool. You could rush shorter. You could do longer. You could do supersets. There's all these things, all these tools that you have to get more out of the time that may not be the absolute best or may not be something that's researched at all, but as a practical tool as coaches yeah. are useful. And, but, but again, I, I'm going to answer your question, but science is not telling you what you're supposed to do. Like a science is, is giving us a framework and, and then you tailor that towards your client's goal time. This is it. I, I think I came across your page because someone like, and, and I came across so many people because after the 52 sets, the Allison and all these students like, oh, check a look what this guy is saying and whatever, blah, blah, blah. And, uh. One of the best uh, breakdowns of our, not because I'm here, like, uh, because you were, I think, were the only one that touched on our discussion and how we try to put a very balanced discussion, showing all the perspectives and like, yeah, do you have that time for that small growth is worth it for you? Go for it. But we would try to show the difference between studies, the effect. And, and again, I, I, I really... We, we didn't say in the paper, like, hey, now it's time to do 52 weekly sets, right? But that's people sometimes, I, again. That's why I don't have a million followers yet, though. Yeah, no, I don't. And I, I really don't want to, man. So it, it's, to be honest, like, like we, we had the conversation. If I lose followers, it, it doesn't change my income. Whatever. I'm, <laughs> I'm fine about that. But it is the, going back to our question. And what you said is absolutely right. If you go to failure right after two minutes, you have a, you're doing ten reps to R and R. So, or if you go ten reps to failure, right? And the load was two twenty five. If you go two minutes after, you're gonna do five reps, or you need to drop the weight big time, right? If you're gonna keep the weight, you're gonna drop number of reps. To keep that up, you need to drop the weight. So performance will drop. And we, what we saw. And was the drop, if you compare with the exercise, the drop between first set and the last set within squat, leg press, and the extension was way larger at the beginning. Mm -hmm. So they, they, they again, they, they got used to. So they were dropping, like you said, they were dropping, they were finishing last set, they were finishing last, the, the first, the first phase of the study, again, was not that impossible, right? They were doing like a five, six sets each. Again, sometimes I drew four sets, but I agree for you, like for, mm. for me, squat, I need a little more rest in between compared to other exercises. So sometimes I go three minutes as well. But what we saw was the performance dropped at the beginning way more compared to the last four weeks of the study. They, they were, I think they were kind of pacing themselves like because it was too hard and hard and they, they were getting, yeah, true. And I'm going to keep it here because if I freeze, the next one's going to be one or I go close to failure. They learned how to pace themselves to to adjust. But again, if the, the rest interval would be three minutes, they would would be different volume load, different progression. And I would say something that I, I think that we, we had that discussion between the high, low load as well. It is another topic. I think there are a few things we can do better in advance. It seems that level of effort is more important when you train at low loads because when you train at moderate high, again, that the, the intensity will do the job. I, I know sometimes people might not like it, but there is a sweet spot that intensity might trump volume. But I, again... It is we need when you say that, do you mean just set volume? Yeah, I think that 
if you are training, yes, let's Cause, be number because volume and, load ends up being similar usually in those. Yeah, right? yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Because think about that: if you're training six RM or six to a, six to R and R, and the last one to failure, you need as many sets if you uh, 10, 12 reps, and they all to be gonna lead the same grow. And the volume load in that case would be way different, right? With a less volume for three by six compared to three by 10. So again, I, I like to say that, yes. And that's another thing. We scientists, oh, the line they get. <laughs> we, we, we scientists, we are not telling people, hey, now go train with a lightweight. Mm -hmm. Not saying that. Is there are different ways to build muscle. And in my opinion, moderate load or heavy they are more efficient because I get the same outcome with a way less volume load. <laughs> so I, I, again, yeah, I know I, I veered off a little bit from the topic, but. And I, I think the, the fact that the, that the, the performance dropped more at the beginning just goes to show how different these protocols are likely from the way that people are just naturally are used to training. Right. Yeah. So there was. There was definitely probably some strength endurance adaptations and also then just the skill of picking their loads and, and, and pacing themselves through of going through there. So I think that just goes to stand okay, just don't get so focused on the number in these volume studies and think yeah. more of like the principle and apply it to yourself. It's not, hey, here, none of these studies are telling you this is the number because that number only correlates to if you're doing everything exactly as it was done in here. And that may or may not yeah. be appropriate for you anyway, based off of what you've currently and, been training. Yeah. And, and again, going back to what you said that uh, the Mayo or uh, Dr. Mayo Wolf did, that protocol for 26, probably he did something that was at least the double day he was used to do it, right? I, I'm assuming that because- I think a, it was probably like five times what he was used to. Again, yeah. that's like a, uh, that was expected. You're probably going to drop the half from your first working set compared to the last so, one. Man, that's insane. Why people do that? Well, he made $1,000. <laughs> oh, really? For it, right? So, yeah. It was that war bed. <laughs> yeah. So, oh, right. yeah. So, I mean, yeah, $1,000 for 90 minutes. That's not, that's not oh, bad, right? Yeah. That, that, that's good. <laughs> yeah. That's good. Right. Right. I mean, I, that's not counting all the soreness and whatnot for the next four or five days, but yeah. yeah and probably again, his swelling and, and soreness would be something that was not what people did in that study, but I mm -hmm. bet probably was sore. Like you said, if it was five times than what he was used to, he was sore for a few days for sure. And uh, did he share something about that? Like, did he get sore or? He he has not elaborated a lot on it other than that he did it showing it was possible and saying it wasn't necessarily fun. Like, like yeah. it, it was a difficult workout, but he hasn't given a lot of details on like his yeah. thoughts on the experience and, and the few things. Yeah, other than I, that, and again, like the, the the first two weeks of studies, usually we have the the big the 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 big trash cans by by because sometimes they throw up. <laughs> it, 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 yeah. Uh, yeah. So I think that may like not to keep rolling on the tangent here, but I think when people say that these protocols are the hardest they've ever trained, sometimes I'm curious of if, if that measure of effort is really based on the density. Because there's a lot of there like there's a lot of ways to train it's hard, about, it's, it's you know, in their perception, right? Because it's, it's like impact. okay, right? Because it's like okay, that is a different hard than doing a bunch of very heavy sets with a lot of rest or all sorts of different ways that you could challenge the body, right? So whether it's more of an endurance base from the density or very long, like you can do very just very brutal single sets if you were doing an extended set protocol like drop sets or rest pauses yeah those are going to be harder on an individual but then how do you scale doing three of those versus six regular and which is harder there's going to be a lot of individual preference mm -hmm. in there so i'm i'm yep. curious if how much of oh this is the hardest i've ever trained is because most people especially from a herbert perspective are not training that densely they're not training to puke i agree <laughs> i can <laughs> But that goes back to, to my point. I think study and, and uh, always, I think in that, it always sounds weird, right? But talk about ourselves. But 
I think I was one of the first studying training people where you need to look what they're doing before they study and, and try to account for that. And I, I, I keep telling there is a, a, a lab and every study comparing supervised and unsupervised training, what they found, supervised training. And, and I think that it, it, I understand the challenge. We, the problem with uh, exercise science as a whole is a new field. We will get there. It's not always lost. We just started, but our studies are too short, right? We have been training for how many years, guys? Like you know, I'm 47, but it is, I've been training for decades at this point. And our studies are underpowered. I think we ideally train people coming because like you said, the density, in usually in the studies protocol, not just the density, then everything's different from sometimes what they are doing. So we need to acclimatize, like giving them some exposure to the lab effect. Then you can measure, that would be like my, my good thing for me. I, I'm not about quantity at all at this point. I keep decreasing the number of publications on a yearly basis because what challenges me, what excites me is like, I need to answer good questions with a good project. And my next training study, I definitely going to count for the lab effect. I'm going to get the training logs because like I said, I think I was one of the first, we need to look at the, 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 what they did before they study. Uh, we need to try to account that in our statistical analysis. So I think it was the rep tempo. I used the training logs from before they study as a co-variable. Co so we need to, in my next study now, like a, we are talking about the swelling project and you also talk about a training project and all right, let's having people train in the lab for five, six weeks. And then after that, they're going to train for the, then we split them up, right? We can split up. That would be cool. Like they have a training intervention in the lab and then I can do a randomization based on the gains for hypertrophy from the largest to the, the last. Then I'm going to randomize for both interventions. But then you talk about five weeks training plus eight, 13 weeks. Then you have a baseline testing, two weeks familiarization before they start training. It's 15, 16 weeks, semester is done. It, it, it's hard, but again, I, I only gonna study, which I'm gonna be supervising. I need to account for that. I don't know when I'm gonna publish, like a, as a mentor, a senior, I keep telling my students, like, I'm not excited about eight weeks projects, not accounting for what they did before. Because again, when it comes to volume, I, we still are scratching the surface. Because, all right, Brad Schofield study, right? So if you calculate the effect sizes, we're very similar to the study I shared with you, showing that the magnitude of the gain was pretty much very, very similar. But Brigato and, and Brad, like in Brigato, they, the reporting was very good because they showed everything that people were doing before. And what we saw in that study was the 24 to 32 weekly sets were the only two groups that increased the volume compared to previous the 16 weeks dropped the volume. So if you look at, if you look at Brad, the probably the 20, I'm talking about quads, the 27 and 45 probably double or triple their volume in the nine weekly sets probably dropped the volume before compared to what they're doing before. So that's something we need to answer. So with reporting gets better, then we can have a good meta-analysis because you have a bunch of meta-analysis with a bad studies. It's not helping uh, at this point most of meta-analysis, my, my opinion. Another, if possible, yeah. if possible, when you guys are looking at like the, what a person's incoming training is, I think if we can get volume load measures, that would be even better than just sets because of this yeah. density description, right? Because it's okay. They were doing this many sets before and they were going to do this many sets, but if it's a different density, are those sets really the we same tried. as sets? Yeah. We tried for the two studies again. And maybe the reasons my studies are different from Brad and Brigato because the randomization I accounted for previous training volume. Mm -hmm. So I'm doing something because again, that's something whether or not the difference between volume performing during the study and previous volume plays a role is something you should advance. But that's for me, it's a more interesting question than discussing sweat sometimes, which is worth it. Yeah. You need to look at, but again, and talk about the, the, the study design. Another thing we, we need a better understanding, like a Brigato and Brigato and, and, and Schofield training status. 
the one of my body mass ratio was 1.3, 1.4. Our study was two, and they were randomized. I, again, does baseline or relative strength plays a role when it comes to the outcomes you are looking at? We don't know as well. So I want to advance to that's the direction I'm going with the next volume studies. But yeah, so again, just a lot. Of, a lot of, <laughs> it's a lot I mean, yeah, and patience is not something that people want to have on these things. They want the ans answers. Yeah, yeah. But so, yeah. I know we can't, yeah. I think that's why so many people jump to conclusions and why, why people in the field or just consumers they complain a little because they they're not happy with the slow drip of information. They want they they want you to publish the study that tells them exactly how to train next so, week. Just so I have an idea, right? The myorepsy study we are doing and started three years ago. We had one leg, then you had the dropout, right? So people drop out from the study. Then like, all right, we need to recruit more people. And then it was, again, I'm co-authoring that paper, but the paper is housed here at UT, like uh, with uh, another friend of mine, professor here. But then he decided, so it's cool, but he did a backwards. We did a chronic phase of my reps. And then let's look at the acute muscle activation. Uh, so when we're going to publish, like why it's taking three years? Because we started, we initialize all the data afterwards, and then we did the one more acute experiment. So we're going to publish the paper. There will be acute experiment about muscle activation and then the chronic experiment with uh, the training, the training intervention. So yes, we had, again, the female version of the infamous 52 weekly sets is on the works. Now we started data collection. Well, we are 2004. Yeah. We started data collection it was late was right after Addison finished the Mayo 52 weekly sets, they started the female version and we just started writing at this point. So it, it, yeah, it takes to do, to get the things done properly. It takes, takes some time. I know people don't have that patience, but. All right. I want to circle back and wrap up our conversation on the methodologies here. So we kind of ended with. My impression is, is that we don't know, we're basically in an absence of evidence on what we can say for sure about swelling. But if you're kind of your guess right now is that with the 72 hours, that probably wasn't at least a significant factor in the measurement. And or that's what we have right now. So it's just best guess, right? Uh, assuming they were doing the same intervention for 16 weeks. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So broadly speaking across like the hypertrophy research in general, so you walked us through kind of looking at the MRI, looking at measuring muscle thickness and kind of how we're measuring cross-sectional areas. So w without MRI, most of what we're looking at is two-dimensional area measurements of some way, shape, or form. And so that brings me then into the, the growing body of evidence of these regional differences that we're seeing. And how much, how, like, how much are we missing with, especially some of these older studies that don't measure multiple sites Then we're not really, we're not getting a good picture of a whole muscle. And then also we still have the limitations of, well, if we're measuring elbow flexion or knee extension, and we're not measuring all of those muscles, how much are we missing the effect of either volume or some other variable because maybe we're not measuring the best muscle to be able to to illustrate that because me personally and i don't know how much you know about what we do at n1 but we teach like our core foundation is teaching applied anatomy and biomechanics and we're talking about how to fully lengthen and shorten certain muscles and then apply that into resistance training and stuff so we're really focused on hey how can i bias this division of the pectoralis more or, or whatnot and so that's that's kind of an area of research that I'm really entrenched in. And what's something I would really would like to see is more and more of those regional measurements. And I don't know if that's something that you share or how big of an influence you think that has when we're not necessarily investigating the question of regional, but basically we're looking at a big picture thing. Do we still need that regional data? You actually referenced the MRI study that you guys did where you, there was non-significant until you went and looked at all the regions. 
I think the first time I shared that live on the podcast, like I share with students all the time in the show in class. Guys, that's great, great question. Here my my take. And I I could not agree more with you that depend depending on the design and the question, yes, we might miss the big, big picture. So if you're comparing intervention A versus B, but both interventions utilize the same exercise. We still missing something, but not that bad, right? Because mm -hmm. that again, it is it, it depends on the question and, and depends on the design. But from the moment we start talking about varying exercises, if short bias versus length bias, you're comparing different exercises, we definitely need to measure more within a muscle length and more between the muscles head of that muscle group. I, I, I think always depends on the question. I, it's something that people don't like when the, because we, we size, we have the ego, right? We think sometimes we're super important. We super intelligent. And I keep telling, come on guys, the bodybuilders, they didn't, they didn't need us. They were bigger way before we started this thing. <laughs> How varying ex something that bodybuilders really like, like you said, right? They're gonna train the chest, they're gonna load resistance profile, lengthening, short bias, whatever. They're gonna vary exercise. They know how to vary exercise. They knew that way before we started to see uh, our studies. It's the same about power lifters. They were way stronger before we start to look at training variables effects on on, on the strength gains. But I think we tried. Tr through science, explain how those things might work or come at a play is what we, we do. And again, provide a framework that coaches and people can utilize based on their lifestyles. What is the best training regimen? The one that your client can stick to it, right? This, this, this one, of course, we can talk more about parameters, what, what makes a good training program. But again, it circle back again about your question is. If the intervention utilized the same exercise, we're still missing something. But yes, uh, one unidimensional measurement and just one spot. I, I personally think we, I would not say you are measuring too little, but here there is room for improvement big, big time. Like uh, we, we got, especially when you're comparing exercises, we, we got to use like a more measurements across the muscle length. So you think about the quads, you get the femur and you have at least two spots. That's what I've been trying to do. There is a limitation, like we said, with ultrasound, most of our labs, we use ultrasound and ultrasound, every study. I think now people, probably people knew that already. Why we only measure VL and rectus femoris? Because you are confident that the measurement arrow is under control it, and that allows us to make inferences about training interventions because we are very good at measuring those two muscles. It's very challenging. That's the reason we've never seen people with ultrasound looking at VM, VI. It, it, it is, again, but uh, when it comes to different exercise intervention, like uh, I, I was saying, within the muscle length and between the muscle heads, like uh, the quads has four heads, uh, we look at each individual had the same for the triceps with, uh, depends on the shoulder position that might be more effective, challenge more the long head than the medial and so on. We definitely, when it comes to looking at different exercise interventions, especially with uh, the longer muscle lengths versus the short ones, we definitely need to look at measure more when it comes to muscle length and within muscle heads. Definitely, I think if that's the research question, you are missing big part of the picture if you just look at one measurement side. Yeah, and I, I would argue that it's even probably important when we're doing the same exercises because the standardization of those exercises may vary between labs. So one, one group may use a wider squat or a deeper squat. One group may use a different depth or foot placement on a leg press. One lab may have a leg extension machine that has a totally different resistance profile than mm -hmm. another lab's machine. Yeah. So because we don't have those standardizations, I'm like, well, actually, like the more that would be better. And a but question, 
just just one thing as about that uh, I'm not telling that one measurement uh, again I would like to see more even if I study you just comparing same exercises I would like to see more but again I agree we think I study we think a lab randomization account technically accounts for difference if someone has preference with a high low bar whatever but you you right when it comes to compare different studies different labs and different studies that would be important to see more measurements. Something that I think we can do better when it comes to exercise science, we don't do quite often. We I never seen like a multi-centered studies. Like I would join with uh, Schaufeld, Clayton Libard, the good friend, Mike Roberts, uh, Sam Buckner, we'd put together a study to increase the our power because we have a more subjects. And then we'd be able to standardize because again, all those labs, we have uh, some overlaps. We have uh, some differences big, big time. And that's a reason, oh, why did they do that way? And the other lab did such, in because we have uh, some overlapping when it comes to a strength machine, like you said, the device available to do measurements. But going to what you said, I, I would love, I, I, I definitely put my name in the middle. I, I don't want to be the first, the last author, but we would do a good service for exercise science the day we come up with a multi-centered study, standardizing, have a multiple measurements, maybe one day. I, I feel like there is a temp for a couple of those going on. I believe there's one going on right now on the range of motion, the length and partial topic, actually a, a multi-site study. Uh, yeah, I know. He told the guy who the last publication is the gastro with the length and partial. The, he called initial. Italo is also collaborating for people from Norway. So I, I know, yeah, I, I know there are some efforts, but we we need so, to do more studies like this. So I have I have a question because it, it's it's one that I'm not a hundred percent sure that I know the answer. But if we take the quads and we look at the vastus medialis, and we're not as confident in our ability to measure that as we are the lateralis and the rec fem. If, do you think that by measuring more that the overall accuracy would increase or is it that because we would have lower confidence in the medialis that that would kind of decrease the confidence in the overall results? Because so, that's where I'm like, hmm, is simply having more data points, is that going to give us a better picture overall, or if those data points are a little less accurate, is, is that actually going to kind of decrease the confidence relative if we use the fewer me measurements? Yeah. Y'all, if y'all depends. And again, we talk about ultrasound, right? It's, it's hard to measure VM, for example, if the measurements are done properly, I think getting more data would be more beneficial than detrimental. That's my point it is as long. And that's because I always tell. I know people, usually they skip, usually they, few people read the, the whole paper, but quite often they skip the, the, the method section, especially stats. And, and again, if it's done properly, getting more information would do more benefit for the field than a, a detrimental or producing more noise. Again, if it's done in the right way and the standardization is quite, again, when it comes to distance, the device standardization, that would be the same. But if the real reliability is also consistent, because with a good reliability, we can track change over time. But it depends how you're doing. So the last critique, I think, on the methodology, and I'm sure this is one you've heard, is just simply the magnitude of difference that's being seen and people just not simply believing that this level of hypertrophy is possible in trained subjects. I believe Samuel Buckner and and Holly, they had their paper like kind of illustrating their doubts on, and, and why they, like they they really think that swelling is a potential factor because they don't think the levels of hypertrophy being seen in this are, we'll say possible or likely. Um, and a, I'll lay a, a couple of my opinions on here and then you can build or disagree or whatever. One of the things I think when you talk about the lab effect is 
if we were to actually measure somebody over the course of several years, likely what we'd see is periods of consistency and inconsistency where they would actually hypertrophy and atrophy, if, especially if we're just talking about everything that goes into muscle thickness, right? Okay. If they're being a little inconsistent with training, they may not be losing myofibrils, but they might be losing some intramuscular fat and glycogen. And we're going to see a lot of this stuff. And then all of a sudden when somebody's put in these studies, it's basically forced consistency of effort. And potentially we're just looking at windows over time where these people would be making progress Right. And that might be part of kind of what happens. And that, that could play also where somebody's coming in because you could have multiple participants coming in, but somebody's been very, very consistent for the last six months. And somebody's been, okay, they meet the criteria, but they haven't been as consistent or whatnot. And I look at that as one possible explanation why we could see more hypertrophy in a given window of time in a study than what we would assume. Like, because if we just look at that and assume that, well, that should just then accumulate linearly over time. If these were trained people training hard, that they would get that same thing 52 weeks of the year, just to throw out the 52 number again. That <laughs> That's probably not likely because even the most dedicated trainees are not, they're not consistent and doing the same thing all of the time. We have highs and we have lows. We have periods where we're bulking and cutting, or we have illnesses, vacations, all sorts of things. So what it, I don't know if that's something that you think is possible and there's what your overall stance is on whether or not you think there is an issue with the magnitude of results and trained subjects in these hypertrophy studies. Mm -hmm. Oh man, it's getting harder to be a scientist nowadays, right? Hey, you, you are more than welcome to just give your opinion on here. This is not a, if you you don't have to cite every word that comes out of, out of your mouth here. No, no, fine. No, I talked to, to, to Buckner. I, I talked to Schofield. Schofield, I, I think we have a, Schofield is a co-author in the paper that high volume did not favor hypertrophy. The, the, I don't know if you noticed, but the paper I, I is under review. Schofield is a co-author. We agree on things. We disagree on other things. I thought Buckner was, we started, we kind of got in touch more recently and, and the same. And I think that is, I think you can talk about anything as long as you are respectful with each other. I always, that's something is big value to me, like being respectful. I know those guys work hard. It's a lot of time to put a study together. And I, don't agree with Buckner on, on the, I know that, and, and again, that's a different perspective and not saying that he's wrong, I'm right, or he's right, I'm wrong. It's just like, there are different ways to look at findings and, and, and talk about it. So, Edison paper and his paper, we need to think that we show the sum of muscle thickness. That means we get one spot, to another one, we added it, and that was like a one centimeters. So if you divide by two, that's 0.50, that's half centimeters. I've been measuring that for a while. And again, if you look on average, the change is about, the average change is 0 0.3 centimeters. And you talk about like Edison study was per spot was 0.5. But uh, it's within the, the, the distribution of the data. I, I don't see that's an outlier, okay? So that's my point. Yes, on average, when you look at those spots, you look at 0 0.3 centimeters. And some studies like a bread was a little higher because the sum of thickness, if you do for bread, is one point something like it w was a little higher, but it's still, I, my perspective is, is like a, like I, I touched on that before, do the baseline values play a role? Because usually on those studies, quite often the group, and again, with an individual RCT and with meta-analysis done properly, with using the right moderators, we can look at if a baseline plays a role, baseline values play a role on the outcomes you are looking at. Because if you look at Brad Schofield's study, for the high volume group, they have a lower baseline for thickness. So, do they have a more room to grow? I, I again, it, it is it is tricky because 
I, I know sometimes people, they get a little excited about talking about research findings, but I, again, 0.3 centimeters is the average. A study that observes 0.5, like Annie's was 0.5, because we, like I said, we had a two different spot. We did a sum is within the normal distribution for that metric. I don't see that as an outlier. And I know some people are, I, I think it's Josh from, I always, I'm pretty bad for last names, but Josh from Michael Zurdo's lab. They are doing on meta analysis on, on volume. And again, I hope we, because there are tools like what you can do with a meta analysis, which is cool that does one particular study change the outcome? And then they can do a sensitive analysis. So you put all this, now they're going to put all the studies together, right? The studies we had after the last meta analysis on volume. And then we can see that, oh, that observation for Brad, the effect size. And again, the effect sizes, they are quite similar. The effect sizes from Brad Schofield are similar to the my last study that's under review. So I, again, because you need to account for that change related to the variation of the data and so on. But as I was saying that the good thing for meta-analysis is done properly, we can look at different moderators and now is the meta-analysis can look at a sensitive analysis to see if one study, one particular study would change the outcome. And then when that happens, sometimes we remove that study. But I, again, I don't think that the observed changes are little, again, were too much or inflated. I think they are within, they are higher compared to other studies. Where they are higher because the measurement, where they are higher because the baseline was lower for that group compared to other groups. But again, I'm still thinking about different ways or variables that would explain the differences between the lab. But I agree with you that if that study from Addison, we repeat, we continue the study for 12 more weeks, the gains will not be the same. Probably would drop and, and until the point, because again, right? It, we not keep training and growing and growing and growing. <laughs> it's, it's not like that. Even the scenario, we were able to keep that up for six months, probably because we did a three months study, 12 weeks. The gains for the second three months phase definitely would be way lower. No, no questions at all. That's something I agree with a Buckner that if you keep training, the rate of change will drop significantly. I believe there was one study that was six months in duration. Okay. That's a fairly older study. I believe it was the one that was on like the Canadian military or, or something like that or whatever. And it had one of the bigger differences, but I don't know that it was like proportional to like, even though it was larger, it was six months, but I don't think it was on the scale that the difference was double or triple yeah. one of the, one of the, I don't know that it was time linear or port, of course, it's like, it's on the higher end which means that, okay, yeah, maybe over time, yes, there's still a benefit, but it's not necessarily... Yeah, but, but again, you can't, you know. In initial returns and usually adaptations, you are a few dark curve, curve linear, right? They do this and they, they settle. <laughs> they level so, up. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So if I'm, if I'm speculating at like kind of like my wish list of what it would look like to kind of test these things, you're already looking at all right, we're going to do the measurements of a time course of, okay, within hours and days extending out. But what I think, like a thing I think might be valuable if if we were really going to settle this question would be, do we put somebody on like a, a minimum effective dose or maintenance volume so that then we're not into that, oh, are we measuring atrophy, but we are potentially restricting swelling as much as possible. Is there like for the week, do, a week or two or whatever it is after the intervention that we would do like a 50% reduction in volume or something like that so that basically we're kind of like removing the possibility of them going to just straight nothing and then we're seeing an exaggerated atrophy because they're no longer actually hydrating the muscle, stimulating the nutrient partitioning and stuff like that. But we're just like, we're bringing it down to the point where we would be fairly confident that, all right, this should no longer be an inflammatory level of volume or whatnot, but we're actually taking them like the equivalent of a deload for maintenance. That's kind of the last element that I would like to see in there. And yeah. that, I laugh because that's a project working on it. 
Yeah. Okay. Awesome. <laughs> I told you the other training, and again, it's challenging, man, because I I want to do a I would say a, a better service for those who complain about the ecological validity and too too many sets. But no, no, now talk seriously about it. I'm really I'm very interesting. I may have a, some bias here, but the study that we are designing, the idea is to do it would be a crossover design. And like when you said that, oh, besi beyond besides the training logs, it would be nice to look at the volume load. Not everyone tracks the volume load. We tried for the last the paper I, I shared with you. We tried a kind of a one third of participants they had the volume load logs. But the study I want to do because that's a question for me now, because again I have a. Four papers in the pipeline with progression in volume, increases in volume. And I hope after that, I, I retire about the topic. Let the, let the young folks and doctors do continue that study. But something besides the swelling project, and it's always tricky to talk about ideas because maybe someone does faster. But again, I, I would be nice. I, I would love to see a similar study. So what we wanted to do is we need to define what is the me we need to come up with uh, inclusion criteria for weekly set number because then those guys they come to the lab they're gonna do we're gonna train we're gonna test the lab effect for six weeks so then you're gonna have a training lab training the, their training logs oh some people are doing 22 weekly sets that study I shared with for you the highest guy was doing 44 sets on the weekly basis and I think the lowest was doing like a six or eight or eight sets. So it's a big, big range. And that would be a crossover design. So, okay, we get all those guys with a different training volume experience and we need a certain inclusion criteria for number of sets. We gonna train them in the lab with a day used volume for six weeks. Then you're gonna measure baseline six weeks. Then you're gonna do six more weeks, which they're gonna drop 30%. And you're going to measure hypertrophy strength. Then another six weeks, they're going to drop 30 more percent. So ultimately, they're going to drop 60 percent. And is that still able to preserve the gains? So again, I really want to go what you said. I laughed because that's what I'm working right now is a project to. And we talk about 18 weeks just for training. We try to. And now I'm trying to make that period a little shorter. Maybe I go five, 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 and then people increase silent. Yeah, but that's too short for training people. But I think that's definitely, a, maybe for me, is one of the most important questions for trained people or people like, like us who enjoy lifting training. Like, how much volume can I drop and still maintain my gains? When you said I laughed, like, I thought, like, oh, here, here, here we go again. No, what's, what's more like, oh, he read my mind because you are working on that at this point. It is designing phase. Okay. We haven't started yet. Well, Doc, we are at two hours now. Really? Um, that went fast. I know. It goes really fast, right? Really fast, right? Uh, yeah. I'm, hopefully you've been enjoying it. I want to be respectful for your time. So my question right now would be, we didn't get into the long muscle length stuff, and there's a few more things that we could talk yeah. about specifically with the MS paper and the unpublished papers. Would I mean, we could do this in a two-part series so that I can let you go today or I can just take what I got. Too often. <laughs> well, I will probably break it up into two parts anyway, just, just for that, right? But, you know, I, I didn't know if you would have a preference because I hate to you, hate to keep you. Uh, you do the pool again. You do the pool again. If people want to hear more from me, I, I, I come back. So, okay. Let's yeah, so. It. Yeah, I would love to have you back so that we can kind of just talk a little bit about the results of the NS study versus the one that's currently waiting for publication and the different results. And I would really want to get into your your critiques on the long muscle length stuff. My my point is the lengthening part shows that I'm like I keep saying, I'm open to be convinced and the weight of evidence is not there at this point because the the quality of the studies that meta analysis that was published has some issues as well. But I think it can be a two in the box. We might be in the same page here, Kat. Yeah. Well, I 100% would like to have that conversation with you. So why don't you just let me know when the next convenient time would be and we can go ahead and film the second part and we can get into that because there's probably an hour 
on, on, on that topic of us going back. I mean, we spent two hours just talking about ultrasounds. So, <laughs> but like yeah. my, my audience will very much appreciate the nuance and, and the details that you provided. And, and I'm very oh, appreciative of your time. Appreciate that. So, thank you very much. So I had a great time. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure you give us a like, subscribe, and leave us a review. And we will see you on the next episode of the N1 Experience.